So does anyone have a minute lightning talk? Okay. Come on up. Okay. Uh, I wanted to say about Leia's, Leia's talk real quick. Um, the in a few years there will be a generation of community folks that came up with this idea. Or it, we were actually just talking about this the other day that there's this whole generation of kids who grew up skating with skate stoppers everywhere. The bumps on every handrail, the bumps on every curb, and all it did was make them better skaters. So it's like, you know, like, you know, and I think, uh, I think Jobs, Steve Jobs said about the, like, oh, we need to include a tutorial on how to type, how to touch type for Mac. And he said, you know, because they were like, some people don't know how to touch type. And he said, eventually all those people will be dead. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Damon Evans. I'm a project manager at the Hybrid Group. Um, the thing I want to talk about really quickly is we all understand that there's a huge amount of value in cross-functional teams and having as much back and forth as you can so that people can fill in the gaps, cover where other people are weak, give better perspectives and things like that. Um, but one thing I want to talk about was ways, better ways to encourage that. Um, everybody's time is valuable, especially when you're working in a consultancy. Everyone has a lot to do. There's too many projects. There's too few developers. There's never time to make this stuff happen. So one of the things I just want to say is that if you really want to try and get your team more cross-functional, you need to basically carve out at least you know, a certain period of time where people are on the payroll, people are on the clock, and your job right now is to talk to each other and learn something you didn't know before. So um, basically, I just want to talk about, yeah, that's, that's basically the talk. Carve out some time, pay people, force them into a box where it's not, there's nothing else to do, and by having at least even just a few hours of trying to show something, someone just a little bit of something they didn't know before, that little bit of information as you go over, you know, as time goes by, can lead into uh, more ability to, to um, chip in when, when something is broken or fix a, a bug when someone else is not around and just make your team overall more cross-functional and work better. So, yeah, give people time and basically force them to play in the same sandbox. Yeah. Who else? Yehuda? How long? Let's say 90 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to continue. You're good. Hello? I wanted to continue on the same topic, uh, I guess, which is, um, so at Strobe, which is uh, Strobe, the company that I'm at right now, uh, one of the things that we started doing a couple months ago is we do weekly quote-unquote stand-ups, which is really just a way for every single department to have someone every, or a couple people every week coming up and showing what they're excited about that they're working on. So Leia will often come in and say, we got a new user group last month. Here are some cool metrics. 500 new people downloaded, blah, blah, blah. Um, so usually someone from engineering will come up and show stuff. Uh, we have, we've had engineering people who are essentially like showing closure code to the rest of the company, which um, I think Leia probably doesn't know what's going on there. But I think the idea that everyone just gets up and says what they're excited about working on to the rest of the company every week um, and every department gets to sort of switch across to whatever, essentially whoever's the most excited that week about what, what they're doing uh, has been really effective at doing the thing that you're saying. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Ron Evans? Uh, I wanna do, I'm going to do a quick one here while Ron comes oh. up. Come on. Um, so I, I've tuted this a couple times. I think I've maybe blogged about it. And my the career part of my life has just gotten better and better in the past few years. And I never thought... Uh, I was really on that path or cared about that path, but each job just gets dreamier and dreamier to the point where I'm firing jobs and I'm downsizing companies, and um, my most recent job, I've just been there for a couple weeks, and the, the one before that, I was only there for two months, and I went into it saying, this is the best thing ever, I get to do what I want for a big pile of money, and I get to drive this thing, and the product is cool, and then two months later, I went to someone else and said, this position doesn't exist, I want you to create it, and I want to do it. And they said, okay. So my, my two-part my two part plan, <clears throat> or my two, two points advice to everyone for, for their career is be friends with amazing people. Seriously, everything good that has come to me in my job, job life is because I had friends working at some place. And then the second part is make ridiculous demands. Because no one will ever pay you 10 bucks an hour if you don't ask for 10 bucks an hour. When I was a kid, I thought 10 bucks an hour was the most amazing thing ever. And no one will, like I said, this job didn't exist. And I said, hey, Dr. Nick, this job should exist, and I want to do it. And he called me back three days later and said, you're hired. All right, so be friends with amazing people. Make ridiculous demands. It's incredible how well it works. Ron Evans.
So we have a problem. It's kind of a good problem, right? Everybody here has a wonderful job because so many people want to hire you to do these amazing things that you do, and it sounds really great. But it's a real problem because we are not creating a new supply of developers at the same rate that we are consuming it. In fact, computer programming education in both the United States and the United Kingdom is dramatically down. Most of the budget that goes to any kind of computer literacy or computer-aided instruction in other areas, it's not going to creating in the next generation of developers. So we are all working on our interesting little cool projects, and we've all heard of these different versions of Ruby, like, you know, JRuby, but it's kind of old. You know, Rubinius, it's for old people. Literally, it's for adults. <laughs> so we propose and have created a project that's called Kids Ruby. And Kids Ruby is a project designed to make it very easy for kids to learn how to program. It's very much influenced by the Hackity Hack project that was created by Why the Lucky Stiff, who, before he disappeared back into the magic programming realm, left us in a wonderful legacy of amazingly interesting things like Hackity Hack. So Kids Ruby is to Hackity Hack kind of like Sinatra is to camping. It takes it and makes it a lot easier for people to contribute. So we've created a couple of things. One is we have the Kids Ruby Editor, which is very much designed like the Commodore 64 or the Apple II. You just turn it on and start programming. We might call it a REPL loop in our development world, but it's really just being able to see what the code does right while you're developing code, which is kind of necessary when you're going to learn these things. So at kidsruby.com, we have the source code available. We also have created the Kids Ruby operating system, which is an Ubuntu remix, so that literally they can take their operating system with them. We've been distributing this on a USB key, and we've done some classes, but there's an amazing new project called Raspberry Pi that's just come out, which is a $25 complete USB-based computer on a stick. So we're going to be working with them, but I really encourage everybody, go to kidsruby.com, get involved, help us develop it, Help us give it to other kids. Help us develop curriculum. Do your own Kids Ruby training class, as some people have done amazing things in this space. Because think of the children. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. really loud. Okay, so you don't have to be a kid to learn Ruby either. Leia should finish that. Uh, <laughs> that. That book is great. It's by Chris Pine. It's a little bitty. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sort of disproportionately developer sort of world here, just because, like, the nerd set is my, my people's. Um, but I seriously don't know a single unemployed Ruby or Rails developer. <laughs> in, in the worst job market we've had since the Great Depression, we, you know, we are in this bubble inside of a bubble, and, you know, like, we're turning down jobs and creating new, you know, just picking new ones or whatever, so... If you're in a weird spot in your life, go pick up that, that book and you'll have a job next month. <laughs> um, any other short ones? JR and then Obi. Um, and then a few of the diaspora boys are here. Um, kind of want to get them up here towards the end to tell their story. JR? Thank you. I drew something a little bit off topic, but the same talking about community and things like this. Something that I saw recently was a, a talk that Rex Ryan gave. Rex is the head coach for the New York Jets. And he implemented something with his players that I thought was great. And I wanted to bring it up to you guys. Um, you know, we've got this community going. We've got guys that I, I love to hang with. You know, Ron Evans, Shane Becker, Kobe Ranquist. I mean, there's a lot of people here that this community runs around. And it's fantastic. And the point that Rex brought up was that he told all of his players, you guys are going to get, start to get camera time. You're going to start to get interviewed by Sports Illustrated and across TV and everything else. And one of the things you really need to do is think beyond yourselves and include the other players when somebody asks you questions about your team. And that's my point, is that think about that when you start to talk about this community. Start to think about how you can lift the people in this community to, to be spoken about and, and to not just in the media but amongst each other. Think about what these people do and how they um, commit to this community and bring them up in that community. Bring them up to the new people who don't know about this community and within the community itself. So that's it. Woo. Um, this question
quick topic. Uh, Ron, you kind of inspired me to uh, mention this, but I'm working with a really incredible designer now named Cody Santelipo, who none of you have heard of because he just turned 17 on Tuesday, <laughs> last Tuesday. It was really funny because I found him through Forrest. I was just combing through examples of people's work, and I contacted some people in New York. And I, I wrote to a few of them and said, hey, I'm going to get a group of people together on Saturday to just, just figure out, you know, how I build my team. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I love working on awesome projects. Um, and then he wrote me back a day before he was supposed to come in and said, by the way, I'm 16. Uh, hopefully it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, um, sure, come in then anyway. Uh, and it turns out that he's been working with Photoshop and Illustrator since he was 11. Uh, so he's he's just this amazing talent, and he was homeschooled uh, for the last year. Uh, so he was basically like, "Yeah, I can start full time, you know, tomorrow." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know what the hell to do, so I like you know started doing some research, and I was like, "You need some working papers. And like, can I meet your parents?" <laughs> uh, so it, it turned out all I. Uh, all I needed to do was to, um, to, to just get him going, and he's, he's just been incredible. So anyway, given that it's such a tight labor market, given that we want to help encourage uh, newer generations to come aboard, I'd encourage you guys uh, to take a look at the younger folks uh, that are you know, heavy participants in some of these communities like Dribble and Forest, uh, even Reddit to a certain degree. A lot of these kids have amazing talent, whether it's with uh, Photoshop and Illustrator, a lot of them have uh, amazing stuff that they're doing on After Effects. Another good way to find them is through YouTube. If you look at these tutorials for various things, including programming, there's a lot of young, you know, teenage uh, kids working on these tutorials, and you look at the dedication and the amazing amount of work that they put into them, and you go, wow, I could totally benefit from that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so, no, so I'm encouraging you to, you Most know. Most developers get, are all children anyway. Yeah, exactly. So they're going to fit right in. So anyway, I just thought I'd add that to that. Too. Uh, hello, I'm Giles, and uh, what I want to say is real quick, uh, a couple years ago I was going around and doing this conference presentation thing about uh, a music thing that I built, because I was very, very interested in music, right? And one of the things that I said at the time uh, is that you can look at technology uh, or programming, for those of you who are programmers, as not being uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not being a what, but a how. And this goes back to, you know, uh, the stuff that we were talking about earlier with, you know, self-sourcing, like designing your career, right? Like right now, my clients are in the entertainment industry and it's because I'm interested in that, right? And <laughs> it's very competitive up here. <laughs> I don't even see a guy. Kids these days. <laughs> So there's that thing of like, if there's this, you know, tremendous amount of opportunity in, uh, you know, where basically the whole uh, industrial complex that used to exist is being destroyed by us and rebuilt into like something completely new, well, you can pretty much decide what part of it that you want to rebuild and think about where you want it to take you. It doesn't have to just be like, oh, you know, this person is cracking the whip, and now that person is cracking the whip, or I go and create my startup, right? It can also just be like, what is it that you want to learn besides code, and what else can you do with it? Because there's no reason not to learn all kinds of different stuff. Um, that's about it. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the diaspora bros. I only see one. Uh, There's one. Another. Uh, should we all come up? Sure. Yeah. You, you can just, you know, uh, you can do like, you know, you're singing a, um, what's a three way duet? Uh, Menage a trio. song. Menage a trio. <coughs> and you can just sort of huddle around it. All right. We don't have to come up. Are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> we don't like you, Dan. Are we signing these?
So I, I guess. Uh, Are you asking now? No, no, I'm just curious. Okay. Just yeah. Tell your story. I just, All right, we're just gonna tell the story, I guess. Uh, so yeah, we started a project called Diaspora. We, uh, it's kind of a good story, I guess, to tell. So uh, I guess we, I guess, met each other building like a. 3D printers, but we're all computer science students from NYU. Um, for some reason, NYU decided that it was okay to give undergraduates a office in the computer science building, so that's kind of where we hung out and kind of like became friends, like just sort of causing trouble and doing dumb shit, I guess, in the, in the computer science building, as maybe some of you programmers used to do. Um, we saw a talk by a guy named Edwin Moblin, it's called Freedom in the Cloud, and depending on uh, how you feel about your software. He's either crazy awesome or just crazy. Um, and uh, he basically just, it was basically a, a big talk about how all these big web services were infringing on people's freedom and lots of things that you know maybe you agree or don't agree with. But the thing I think that rang true for me was that if you don't like this as a technologist, why don't you try to make something better? And so we kind of said, you know, this sounds pretty hard, but kind of fun, and we like to you know, mess around, so we kind of just started coding stuff and seeing what we could do, and you know, just kind of trying to cause as much trouble as possible, I guess. Uh, at some point, we just started, you know, working on it Friday nights, pizza, whatever, you know, normal, just hanging out. Um, at some point, we were like, hey, this is kind of fun. Like, maybe we could try to do this for the summer. Like, maybe, uh, maybe someone would like be willing to kind of give us money to work on it for the summer. We could go put it on GitHub and then like, go get a real job. Um, so what, what is it? You haven't explained it. Oh, sorry. A diaspora is a piece of open source software that enables, I guess, uh, distributed social networking. So it means that like people's information is in different places on the internet, but we can still communicate in a way that we come to expect on like Facebook and sort of centralized services. So um, at a very high level, like if I have a Gmail account, you have a Yahoo account, I can like still send you an email. Kind of really stupid if you couldn't. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, that's not the case with us. It was really just, but it was this idea, I think, of just us being uh, kind of curious about it. So, uh, one of our professors had like popped that hackathon on it was like on Kickstarter. It was just uh, so basically you buy us like code and stuff in so, we, so a bunch of kids could like code for 24 hours. And uh, we said, hmm, maybe, maybe on Kickstarter people would give us like $10,000 or any amount of money, so we could just work on it the summer instead of getting real jobs because that didn't sound like fun. It sounds like we could learn more stuff and basically have a lot more fun if we could just go like hack a house in the woods for four months and see how we did. Uh, and uh, so after basically Dan and I like, arguing really vehemently on like whether we, people would ever give us money at all, let alone ten thousand um, dollars, we put up our our project and like sent maybe like 10 emails to people and uh, all of a sudden like people we didn't know like, started tweeting about it and all of a sudden people started like writing blog posts that these kids from NYU are building an anti-Facebook thing and um, basically yeah and then on like the EFF tweeted about us which yeah. is like a little nerd win <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it just and it just all of a sudden all these people started picking up on it and uh, we got it then some guy from the New York Times wrote an article about the fact that we were like doing this project and we ended up raising over two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> for our like summer project. Where we were like, hmm, maybe we want to like try this out and just like see how see how it goes. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, in that like lots of other crazy things happen. Actually, like Pivotal Labs kind of got in contact and was like, hey, you guys sound like you guys sound pretty cool, and you might need a little bit of just like. Help hanging out. That's a really fancy Ruby consultancy in San Francisco. They're like, hey, we'll, we'll give you you know two free desks, and you can just come hang out, and code. And we're like, okay, sounds pretty good. And so I guess that all happened like a year ago, uh, and uh, you know we've since become like the pivotal labs, like fish tank. Like they're bringing new clients, and like, have you heard about those diaspora kids? They sit over there. And like, <laughs> we feed them, and like they ask us questions. <laughs> But uh, I, I actually, that's maybe not the most compelling story I've ever told the story, but I think it is really kind of uh, related to what I'm sort of hearing out here, which is, you know, if you want to do something or you have a curiosity about something, like, you should try to do it, and you should also, another thing I would just like to tell people that you're excited about something and that you want to do something, because 
if a smart person you know maybe is also excited, that's a good indicator that uh, you will have a lot of fun and you will probably be really successful. Um, because you know it's hard to like totally fail if you're doing something and having fun while you do it. So uh, I guess that's the most important thing I've learned in the past year. Yeah. So, <clears throat> actually, Max just reminded me of something. Hello. Hello. Can everybody hear? Um, so, the, the Save the Children hashtag that I heard through many of these lightning talks, I feel there's two small points which can be reinforced. Hello. 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 Um, and so, the first is give kids space. And the second is buy kids toys to play with. Right, because that's what happened to us it, twice. Right, um, the space part we had an office, and then Pivotal Labs gave us a couple of desks. Um, and it, as far as the the toys, we had, we like, the way we all met was making a maker bot, a three D printer, which allows you to take bits and turn them into atoms. And and yeah, so so that's just something that I think we should all keep in mind when we're raising the new generations of hackers. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I did want to, uh, what Max just said, like, um, and sort of what other people are saying, it's like, sort of like this kind of happened to us, because we just like, had a gut feeling that it was like a good idea to do it, right? Like, uh, right before we were raising money, like, I went on a, a Microsoft interview, uh, <laughs> so they shipped me out to Seattle, and like kind of halfway through, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, it's kind of lame. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> kind of lame. Um, <laughs> sort of. So much for that job. Um, but um, yeah, like it was like kind of like a realization, because like before I went on this, this interview, I was like telling my parents about, oh, like we're kicking around this project and we're thinking about raising money and my parents were like, that's, that's, that's cool, it sounds fun, like, you should get a real job, you should get something with like health insurance and all this crap. And I was like, yeah, maybe I should, so like, you know, go on this interview, but it was kind of an eye-opener, it's like, well, I don't want to be doing this, uh, this, this big corporate thing, and like, maybe, maybe this like crazy idea we have, like, could actually go somewhere, like, I don't know, right? So like, we actually like ended up raising all this money and like, I kind of attribute it like for like, personally, it's just like kind of going off of a whim, like might as well try it, like, um, I mean, especially where we were, but I feel like it can like kind of pertain to anybody. It's just like, just like do it. Like, like what Nike says, right? Just like, there's like, like who cares if you fail? Like if you fail, then you could, okay, you can work at Microsoft. But, but you might as well just go. Uh, okay. Maybe not Microsoft, but I don't want to offend anybody. Everybody here uses a Mac, so I don't feel too bad. Um, but yeah, just like try it. Worst thing is you're at Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, I like the idea of Microsoft as a safety screw. Come <laughs> 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 back, back Europe, and if that doesn't work out, I guess I'll work at Microsoft. One of my uh, favorite little footnotes in the Dias story is uh, two of them just graduated NYU, and two of them decided to like put it on hold. Two cool for school. That's a definite term. Whatever. I like that. I, I support anyone who quit school. Uh, we've got ten alleged minutes. Till lunch, I say we, unless someone else, any other? Okay, so Nathan Murner Duke here. <laughs> I, I wanna give this guy a good setup. Right. Uh, I was 13 years old, I was smaller body, about the same size head. And uh, I lived in Noblesville, Indiana, you know, the suburbs, um, for a couple years and didn't really have any friends. It was just whoever was in my class that year. And um, so I didn't have anyone to talk to in the hallway uh, before classes started freshman year of high school, and this guy, uh, his family had just moved to Noblesville, Indiana, like two days before, so he had a legitimate excuse to not have any friends. <laughs> so we both went to our first period of class, which was gym, and uh, we sat next to each other, and that was 16 years ago? That was 31 minus 13? 14? 
Seven, eighteen. Wait, carry the one. <laughs> and uh, he was wearing a T-shirt that said "Barting Sucks," and his backpack had all kinds of like "They Might Be Giants" and like Green Day and stuff written on it, and, like whiteout marker. And we we're fast friends, and uh, still ever since. So I have no idea what he's talking about. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all right. Hi, I'm Nate. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> I know next to nothing. I'll, I'll say nothing about programming. I took a basic programming class when I was in fourth grade, and that was it. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's um, programs on an Apple IIe. Apple IIe. It's true. Um, okay, so, but but I am very much a nerd, um, as I assume y'all are. I I'm trying to make a, a board game. Um, I have. <laughs> 800 plus 8-bit Nintendo games. <laughs> I am compiling a comic book I made in sixth grade into a hardcover volume just for my own amusement. Um, but this, this is just a, just an interesting story, I guess. So I always heard that um, when you die, your life flashes before your eyes, but that is totally not what happened to me and my near-death experience. So, I, it's July of 2009, two weeks before I'm getting ready to be married, and I'm in Portland, Oregon, it's like 107 degrees and I have the flu. And I'm just bedridden and I feel awful and I just haven't done anything all day except watch crappy shows on Netflix or whatever. And I feel like, oh, I really have to go to the bathroom. So I get up and I'm wandering into the bathroom and I sit down and I'm sitting there and like my my hands are kind of tingly a little bit and I'm like what the hell is going on so I'm like and then my face starts to feel kind of tingly and I'm taking deep breaths trying to calm myself down and then like my hands start to feel like they're kind of like crunching in a little bit and I'm like what the hell is going on and my fingers are getting stiff and I can't really move them very well and I'm like Ugh! and my hands are cut both my hands are like this and I'm trying to pry them apart and they kind of snap back like this my hands start curling in. I'm like, oh my god, I'm fucking dying, and I'm like freaking out. And oh, by the way, um, my fiance is in Wisconsin preparing for the wedding. I'm home alone, and um, so at this point, I'm like, I, I'm dying. I have to get my phone and call 911. My phone's in the back in the bedroom. So I'm I'm sitting. I I was. Taking the dump, and my pants are my ankles, and so I try to stand up, but like my legs aren't really working very well. And my body's like curling in, and I'm like trying to walk, but I'm trying to like pull up my pants because if I die, I don't want anybody to make it. So I'm like pulling my pants up and trying to like walk into the into the bedroom, and I like flop down on the bed. And at this point, like my muscles are all really tensed up, and it hurts really bad. And I see my phone; it's like sitting on the bed, and I try to have the shittiest phone I can, so I have this like crappy <coughs> flip phone, and I'm trying to open it, but my hands are all curled in like this, and I can't open it, so I kind of hold it against the bed and put my teeth in and crack it open, and I can't dial, and I'm just like jamming on the call button, trying to just call whoever will answer the phone next. So I push it a bunch of times, and it starts ringing, and luckily it was my fiance, and so she answers the phone, oh, hey, Nate, and I'm like, oh, I'm fucking dying! <laughs> She's like, what are you talking about? Um, hold on, hold on, just calm down. And I'm like, ah! I'm screaming, and I'm like, I'm like a, like a, you know when a beetle dies and their legs all curl in like this? And I'm like writhing around on the bed. And she grabs, she's like, stay on the phone, stay on the phone. She runs and grabs another, oh, she's a nurse, also. She grabs another phone, um, calls our friend who lives relatively close by, and is like, go over to the house now, Nate's dying. And, and, and so then she's like asking me questions, like, can you see? Do you know who you are? You know, all these sort of making sure, like, okay, it's not whatever, it's not whatever, it's not whatever. Friend shows up, but doesn't realize that it's quite as emergency as it is, and she's like, knock on the door, and just waiting for me to answer the door, but, and she hears this screaming, so she kind of busts in, and I, <laughs> at this point, they don't really know what's going on, but it's starting to sort of reverse itself. I can start to kind of move my hands a little bit, and, I'm, uh, and then, but I'm just like totally exhausted, and I can't really move or talk or do much of anything. My friend takes me to this to the hospital, and it turns out that I had had an advanced vasovagal episode, which is basically like, for various reasons, your heart kind of your blood pressure drops drastically, and so your brain is like oh, we're dying, let's not send any blood to any parts of the body except the brain and the heart, and let's just keep living. And so, <laughs> and so it was a combination of being really sick, 
being extremely hot, being um, very dehydrated, and um, getting up too quickly and being lightheaded, and then also sitting down and bearing down to poop. <laughs> and so all those things together like made this crazy shit storm that had been on the plane. So basically they just said, drink some Gatorade and you'll be fine. <laughs> But I, I really thought I was dying. Like, there was no question in my mind, this is the end. And so, like, while I'm writhing around in pain, my, I'm not thinking, like, oh, this has been my life. Two thoughts. One was, my fiance is going to be very furious with me if I die, like, two weeks before we get married. And the other was, it would be super embarrassing for me. I'm very much an atheist that if I survive this, if I somehow found God at the end, that would be extremely embarrassing. Um, so anyway, that was about the time I almost died. Thanks.